Grace to you and peace from God, the creator of all things, and the giver of life itself, and from Jesus Christ, in whom we learn how to live. Amen. You may be seated. As we begin this funeral service, hear these words of blessing from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have gathered this afternoon to remember and honor the life of Stan Valenta. And to, and to release him into the care of the God who walks with us through dark, life's darkest valleys and prepares a table for us, leading us into right paths. We are here to surround you, Ada, with our love and support and to uphold your whole family. And today we also remember Stan's entire life journey as husband, and father and grandfather and great-grandfather as someone who worked so hard and could build things and fix and jimmy together almost anything, who loved to collect all manner of wood and tools and nails and screws because you might just need them someday, as someone who had a warm smile, sometimes just with that bit of mischievous grin, as someone who loved and took care of his house in St. Jacob's before moving with Ada out to the mobile home near Bryan at Conestoga Lake. We also remember these last few years when Stan slowed down, struggled with dementia, and needed the good care at Barn Swallow. Stan died last Wednesday after coming back from so many spells before and after some precious windows of some communication in those last days. And like for all of us, we remember both the simplicity and complexity of our human lives and relationships. And most of all, we give thanks for Stan's life and offer him now into God's care. I invite us to pray. Eternal God, who changes not in life or death, be our assurance as we mourn the death of Stan Valenta and commit him into your care. Give us relief from grief and open our hearts to your never to your never failing love. Uphold Ada, Brian and Mariana, David and Karen, Dennis, Howard, Calvin and Jane, and all the great grandchildren and grandchildren, all the family. Holy Spirit, who guides through the goings out and comings in of all our life, be our peace within the mystery of death. Give us your comforting presence, your ever-caring refuge, so that death will not be a defeat, but a meeting with the God we love. Jesus Christ, who passes from death to life, be our triumph over suffering and death. Give us sustaining grace and assurance. Receive us unto yourself and hold us always in the memory of yourself and your care. Amen. Most of today's service will go unannounced. We are pleased to have Pastor Gordon right here from Woodside Bible Chapel in Elmira to share the message and with family connections and involvement in that congregation. And family is also contributing all the music and the tributes this afternoon. May God's love and comfort and faithfulness surround us all during this time of worship. I invite us to sing. Please join in your hymnal, Voices Together, in your pews, 419, 419. 
For those of you who are comfortable and can, I'm going to invite you to stand so that you can sing out. 419. Hear these words of comfort and hope, first from the Gospel of John and then the book of Revelation. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. So that, you, so that where I am, there I will be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And from Revelation, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, 
and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away.
that the only scars in heaven are on the hands that hold you now. Thanks, Kelvin. Hi, everyone. We gather to remember and reflect upon a friend, <clears throat> a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, a mentor, a damn hard worker, Stan Valenta. To me, Stan became my father-in-law after marrying his only daughter, the late Carol Ann. I am honored to have the opportunity to give tribute on Carol's behalf, as well as my own. So marriage gave me another set of parents. Honestly, I thought this was pretty sweet. Truthfully, I can never remember my father-in-law getting upset with me to the point of yelling. All I remember is Stan once saying, okay, all I have to say is this, at barely an elevated tone you know, and trying to collect his words before announcing this versus Howard Sr., dad, blurting out something like, what the hell were you thinking? Immediately before hearing my side of the story. When dating Carol, she joked to me about listening to her father speaking over the phone. Hello, this is Stan speaking. <clears throat> Valenta. Ha, 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 Carol would laugh. He speaks Valenta. To me, Stan was an honest, hardworking man, always willing to give you a hand, though sometimes hard to communicate with. I remember before we bought our house, living in a townhouse, 1990, 91, around there, I bought these tile board panels to replace damaged traditional tub tiles and grouting. You know, I thought this was easy, no replacing tile by tile. I tore down what was there, my brother James, and Stan's job during that day while I was at work was to install these tile boards. I found out Stan always adds a safety factor to his work, like a hundred times. When I got home from work, I saw how well these boards were clamped to the wall. There was no way these boards were going to move before the back and glue dried. They could have easily handled seismic activity. I also found out another board needed to be purchased for fit. A job well done. A lazy Walters would never put in such an effort with extra spare pieces left over to boot. Carol and I bought our house in 1996. There was an old deck in back, and Carol and I wanted Dad to take a look at it and let us know what his thoughts were, you know, what boards should be replaced and that kind of thing. Remember I mentioned sometimes a bit of a communication problem? So later Carol noticed that the deck is pretty much completely torn down, <laughs> and she kind of freaks, but no worries. Hardworking Stan pretty much rebuilt the new deck, did not charge us for his time and labor, just materials, and we ended up with lots of extra hardware for future projects. Back in 2002, our only daughter, Cynthia, was born. Later growing up, and after her mom, Stan's only daughter, died in January 2019, I wondered and asked, 
Are you a hardworking Valenta or a lazy Walters? Well, I can tell you she's a hardworking Valenta. She helped me through that loss, but in my own mind, she saved me. I can share with you all as well the family Christmases after 2010 with mom and dad were smaller as they downsized, sold the family home, and moved to an all-season trailer. We would get together for Christmas, the five of us there, and honestly, I really enjoyed it. After the meal, mom would relax and sit on her left chair. Carol and Stan versus Cynthia and me playing crokinole together. Father-daughter versus father-daughter. We had fun, you know. Even as dad's Alzheimer's progressed, we enjoyed. There wasn't the communication of thoughts. There was just each other's company and playing the game. A generation difference between father, daughter teams, but it was evenly matched and competitive. Dad moved to Barnswallow Care maybe a year before Carol passed away. He was fully aware of what happened and there was no dulling of this sting. I can only imagine. Dad passed away 2013. Sorry, Dad passed away October the 13th, 2022. Three years, nine months, seven days after his daughter. To me, in my mind, maybe my biased opinion, Dad spiraled down after Carol's passing. Sometimes he had better days and make, could make conversation and, and others not. I really admire his family for having celebrations at Barnswallow for him with children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren when they could. I would sometimes see him very sad and cry as the gang had to leave. Then there was COVID, isolation, and lockdowns. I can only imagine. I think of the words from the song, I can only imagine, mercy me. I can only imagine what it will be like. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine you are together again with your daughter. You are dancing again with this beautiful bride on her wedding night. She is playing with you again as a little girl. And you are her father, her mentor, her protector, her dad. You are smiling. You are happy. You're playing crokinole together. You are healthy, pain and sorrow free, of clear mind. I love you and miss you, Dad. God damn, Alzheimer's. Who was this man? He was my dad. Probably the hardest working man I ever knew. 
One look at his hands will testify to that. He taught me the value of hard work. He taught me the value of things. He didn't like waste. He was into recycling before it was fashionable, no doubt as a result of growing up in the Depression years. He personified loyalty and generosity to a fault. He had the patience of Job. He hated to see injustice anywhere. Sometimes he may have had a hard time communicating clearly, but he knew his mind. He was a lot smarter than many people gave him credit for. He was very forgiving of faults or mistakes often especially especially mine. And whatever he was doing, there was only one way to do it, the right way, even if it didn't really matter. And shingling a roof, for example, mm -hmm. if, your, if your runs developed a bit of a curve or were crooked, he wouldn't be happy or satisfied until you ripped them up and redid it, notwithstanding the fact that they would have shed water just fine. It wasn't right, and he didn't want that. He was hopeless when it came to anything with a small gas engine. Um, I caught him one time, 80 years old, 10 feet up a ladder with a chainsaw. He was quite upset when I took the saw and the ladder away. I told him if there was any more trees needed to be trimmed, I said I would look after it. I mentioned generosity. He used to say, for example, I don't remember the circumstances exactly, but it must have been there was the possibility of company coming or a couple extra pe people at the dinner table. And he said, if there's not enough food, he said, that's very easily solved. You just add more. Just add more water to the soup. He'd, he'd have been very happy to do that. A couple of years ago, I forgot his birthday. He said, don't worry about that at all. He said, there are 364 other days in the year. How you treat me on those days is a lot more important than this one day. I know for a fact that I disappointed him, probably hurt him in some cases. I also know that he never remembered any of those. Goodbye, Dad. Love you. I started thinking about what I might say at Dad's funeral, and at first I didn't know where to start. How do you give tribute to 89 years? <clears throat> then I started thinking of things faster than I could write once I got started. <clears throat> Dad grew up with very little luxury. I don't know a lot about his childhood, but he told one story of his mother buying him a new pair of skates. When his dad found out, He said they couldn't afford them. And they were returned to the store. About the only thing Dad would spend money on was a good tool. He rarely spent money on himself. Uh, and he worked hard to support his family. Dad taught us all honesty, dedication, and hard work. He valued hard work. If Dad built something, <coughs> 
it would stand the test of time. And if you wanted to take it something apart that he put together, you would have to fight to do it. He taught me how to hammer and build using simple tools, a plumb bob, a string, a level, <clears throat> and a square. I have renovated many houses and built one, and Dad was always there ready to help with the truck, trailer, tools, and material. <clears throat> Anytime one of his kids had a project or a job to do, he would be there to help as long as he was needed. He would outlast me and had incredible strength right up to the end of his life. Mom and Dad raised us five kids in a house that Dad built on a four-acre property at the edge of St. Jacob's that they bought from Mom's parents for $900. At the time, my grandpa, Dad's father, had planned a trip back to the old country, which was Czechoslovakia. Grandpa was a cabinet maker by trade, a true craftsman. <coughs> When, uh, when he found out that Dad was going to build a house, he postponed his trip so he could be here to help. Uh, uh, unfortunately, he passed away before he was able to take that trip. I know that made a Profound, profound impact on Dad. He had a very giving heart. Many times, he put his own jobs on hold to help others. He really impressed upon me that you need to be aware of what's going on around you. Um, you have to help others when they need it, not when it's convenient for you, even if they don't ask. And he lived that. How right you were, Dad. If we all did that, I believe the world would be a better place. Dad was very interested in recycling, reusing anything, everything, especially lumber. I believe that came out of his family immigrating with nothing. I used to help Dad pull nails out of used lumber that he would bring home from job sites. Then we used that lumber to build many things. We built a small barn, that was for a pony that we had when we were small, and then the brain used for a horse later. We built a garage, a sugar shanty, sheds and picnic tables and saw horses and many other things. Uh, dad was not musical. Mom used to say that Dad couldn't carry a tune in his pocket. However, he did love music. I remember, remember him telling me that the Tennessee Waltz was one of his favorites. He also loved Johnny Cash. Who doesn't? I wonder if Johnny wrote the song, If I Was a Carpenter, for Dad. Hmm. This week, while looking through pictures, we found a, a picture of Dad dancing with Carol at her wedding. It was nearly four years ago that my sister Carol passed away from cancer. Uh, that is my favorite picture we have of Carol and Dad together. They both looked really good that day. I believe that Dad is singing perfectly in tune now in heaven with Carol, Jonathan, and Tyler. Maybe a little Johnny Cash. We love you, Dad, and we'll meet you in heaven. <clears throat> Many of you may not be aware, but my dad did definitely have a mischievous side to him. One of my first memories of misbehaving in a car is squealing in delight as I shouted, Go faster, Dad! while he buried the needle on the family's 68 Galaxy between our driveway in St. Jacob's and Wagner's Corner. Dad was definitely smiling and giggling and laughing as much as me. Another time, while snowmobiling with him on behind me, we accidentally jumped a creek bed. You say, how do you accidentally do that? I'm not quite sure, but we accidentally jumped. We landed hard. His helmet hit mine. I hit the windshield. After we collected ourselves for a little while, we determined that the best course of action should be don't tell mom. In later years, he was never more mischievous than when it came to the, um, basically being in the presence of a potluck lunch he could really eat. Um, using the crowd of witnesses as a sort of a human shield, he defied a certain, warning, a, a certain someone's warning, Stan, don't you dare take another piece of pie. He would take the challenge, grin from ear to ear, and fill his plate again 
making sure to eat it quickly while staying surrounded by his enablers. Dad was always quite easygoing when it came to me trying new things. I remember him finally uh, letting me ride his motorcycle that was far too big for me in a field behind our house. He asked me if I knew how to ride it. I said yes, thus ending my lesson. He spent that Sunday afternoon very patiently reading a book in the shade while I did laps. Never asked me to stop. I think I pretty much emptied the gas tank. Uh, I'd have to stop at a big rock because I couldn't touch the ground. Building both of the homes I lived in during my childhood, after hours in his spare time, my dad was the hardest working man I've ever known. So many stories of dad involve working with him, watching him and learning from him. He would always have an age appropriate job for me. First picking up garbage, then pulling nails, carrying lumber, and eventually working side by side with him. He would always say, you watch and learn, and someday, when I'm not here, then you can do it yourself. In my adult years, my projects always seemed to become his projects too. Offering, offering his massive stockpile of recycled materials, all the tools I needed for the job, including just some of the just-in-case tools, he would drop what he was doing, it helped me for an hour or a day or a week. There was never a limit on his time. Dad was not always an, a great communicator. Verbalize, verbalizing his feelings didn't come easy for him. Though I did hear I love you on occasion, understanding that his love language was acts of service made it easy to see the love he had for his, his wife, his family, and his extended community. Dad's Christian faith, faith was very much the same. While not always wearing his faith on his sleeve, he never hesitated to roll up his sleeves to help not only his immediate family, but his neighbors, his church family, and beyond. I have memories of Dad going off for the day, volunteering somewhere. Many construction products, like the very first Habitat for Humanity home here in Kitchener, actually, I think Canada, also natural disasters, including a major flood in the, in the town of New Hamburg that's now been my family's home for 18 years, and the Woodstock tornado of 1979 that struck, well, my now wife hit as a young child in her basement. My father spoke loudly with his actions, but as dementia took its toll, both physically and mentally, he slowly lost his first language. As his uh, illness progressed, while speaking less and less, he eventually relied on his eyes and smile to share his emotions. Right to the end, he shared his emotions well. So many caregivers, so many of his caregivers have expressed their affection towards him and memories of that warm smile. I would, on behalf of the whole family, like to express our most sincere appreciation towards the entire staff who cared for our father at Robins Grove. You are wonderful to our father, and we thank you for that. You as caregivers are absolutely the very finest, uh, most important people in our society. And now, Dad, Dad just, as, just like you said, I watched and I learned And some day has come, and now you're not here, and now I can do it myself. I love you and I miss you. Thank you for teaching me. I'll see you again. In your hymnal number 436, 436,
I'm wondering if we could sing on verse two just the upper treble voices, the soprano, and verse three, if we could try just the lower voices, singing soprano and octave lower. So that's verse two, the high soprano line only, and verse three, uh, lower voices singing the soprano line and octave lower. Okay, otherwise, feel free to join uh, four parts throughout. And I'm going to invite those who can to stand. So.
Ada, God be with you today. An honor to be here with each one of you. And I, I want to say, Brian and David, and Calvin and Howard, thank you for honoring this man so very, very well. You made it through. You did really well. And I'm sure at this moment, you're really glad that you did. And uh, it's a beautiful picture just seeing the four of you, arms around each other and supporting each other. That's a beautiful picture. Thank you. King Solomon was famed for his wisdom. On one occasion, he made a statement which may at first seem a little bit puzzling to us. He said, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Better, if you like, to be at a funeral than at a party. Now, I, I suspect if you asked someone on the street, which would you rather do, they might say, well, a party any day of the week. But what did he mean? Better to be here at a funeral than at a party. Well, he goes on and he says, it's better to be at a house of mourning than a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every person, and the living take it to heart. All of us, unless Christ were to come before, before that day, all of us will have a day when we lie, as Stan does now. And we ought to take that to heart. Why? Because if we keep this day in mind, we may live all of the other ones all the more meaningfully. Recognizing that all of us, our lives will come to an end, that if we admit the reality of death, its inevitability, we may live more purposefully. We don't have endless time, so we want to love more fully. We will engage in more meaningful activity love in our relationships more deeply, and to prepare for our own death through faith in Christ so that we can live more abundantly to the full. Recognizing that life and each day that we have is a gift from God, given for but a short time, that may cause us to treasure it more, to use it more wisely, to forgive to reconcile, to love well, and to recognize that relationships we have are more valuable than any possession. I didn't hear any of you four mention, wasn't it great that we had all these things? I heard you talk about relationship. I heard you talk about what really mattered. Well, I want to look at a wonderful story that we have in Scripture. It's, it's found, actually, in John's Gospel, a little bit earlier than the reading that Mark that you read, and it happens in a town called Bethany. And there we see a family with three siblings, a brother and two sisters, each with their own unique personality. And I guess, like all siblings, they, they didn't always get along perfectly. Lazarus was one of them, and he was a rather quiet and reserved man. As a matter of fact, we don't have any recorded words that he said. But he was clearly a solid friend, much loved by his sisters and loved by Jesus himself as a particular friend. And, you know, Calvin, you said something in the hall earlier, and it kind of reminds me of Lazarus, a person who maybe didn't speak a lot, but let his actions speak for him. Maybe like your dad. Lazarus, a quiet person who let his actions speak for him. The only action we actually know about is, is one time at a meal he was just leaning on Jesus' side, just there with him, reclining at the meal with Jesus. Martha, on the other hand, a woman of high energy, a strong woman, 
capable, confident, organized, a hard worker, some of the, that quality that some of you talked about, that high energy, ready to serve. She could also, at times, be a little bit uh, abrasive in her comments. She was frustrated on one occasion, at least, with her sister over her apparent unwillingness to help out. Highly organized. Then there was Mary. Reflective. Insightful. Impulsive. Generous. Sensitive. Deeply spiritual. Ready to just sit and learn and feel deeply. And here's the point. Jesus loved each of them deeply and individually. Each of us have our different personalities, our different qualities, our different foibles as well. And sometimes we can be thrilled at those qualities in each other, sometimes frustrated. Jesus loves and treasures each of us individually, values us individually, our personalities, our quirks, our strengths, and yes, he knows our challenges. And so in this home in Bethany with these three siblings, their home was a place of particular safety and solace for Jesus. We see that it was a place that he went to when he wanted to just rest, just be himself, get away from the cares and even increasingly the dangers of his ministry. And as, he, as Jesus faced greater opposition and threats in his life, he would go to this town, this home in Bethany, and find a safe place there. But on this particular occasion, chronicled in chapter 11 of John, Lazarus became very ill and the sisters feared for his life. And so they did the thing that was most natural to them. They sent a message to Jesus. And it said simply, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Your dear friend is very sick. It didn't need to say anything more. And the assumption, I'm sure, was that Jesus would come immediately and do something about this. And yet we read puzzling words. We read there, when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. And if you know the story, you, you, you know that, in a sense, of course, it did, at least immediately. And so puzzling then to read this, no, this sickness happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. There's eternal purposes, eternal realities that, that you, the disciples, do not understand. And, and I'm sure each of you have asked questions over the years, questions at premature deaths, questions over the... Uh, scourge of Alzheimer's and, and all of those questions that accompany that. There are things we don't understand that we'd love to get answers to. And the disciples surely were scratching their heads. And, and even increasingly as we read on, although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Hard to understand. What could be so important, Jesus, that you would stay here when your friend is sick and you love Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? Surely that would mean that you would go immediately and deal with this issue. And he stays the extra two days. We don't always understand God's ways here. Finally, after two days, he says to his disciples, let's go back now to Judea. In other words, let's go to Bethany, this little village. And now the disciples are objecting. Teacher, just a few days ago, the people in Judea were ready to stone you and you're going to go there again. Their assumption seemed to be that Jesus had stayed away from Bethany out of fear for his own life or 
a sober recognition of the danger in Jerusalem. And yet, now he wants to go, apparently, after he could be of any help. Very perplexing for the disciples at this point. Jesus said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him. And the disciples' misunderstanding said, well, if he's sleeping, he'll get better soon. They thought Jesus meant that Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant that Lazarus had died. Jesus often talked about death as just sleep. And so he tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Let's go and see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said, well, let's go as well that we might die with him. Really quite pessimistic in his outlook at this point. And all of that is background for when Jesus arrives at this little town of Bethany and he was told that Lazarus has already been dead for four days. Bethany was just down the road from Jerusalem. And we read there that Martha, this organized, highly capable woman, comes out to Jesus and meets him. Mary stayed in the house, both true to their character. Martha doesn't wait. She heads right out to be with Jesus. And, and not surprisingly at all, Mary remains at home. And Martha looks Jesus right in the eye and says with deep honesty, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The honest implication was, Jesus, where were you? Why didn't you come sooner? This didn't need to happen. You could have stopped this. And yet, mixed with that bitter disappointment was also a flicker of faith because she says, even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. I don't know if even she knew what she meant, but somehow there was this mixture of disappointment and faith, something I think that if we're honest, we all experience that mixture from time to time. And, and Martha, looking him in the eye, said, even now, I think you could do something. And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. Oh, there is an afterlife, but for Martha, that seems so far away. And so she said, well, yes, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. I recognize that. Jesus then says these incredibly beautiful words. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? These most glorious words ever spoken. He states, firstly as a truth, I am the resurrection, and then asks if Martha believes this. Jesus here is unequivocally, unashamedly stating that he is uniquely the resurrection. He's not just saying that he would rise from the dead. That would be astounding enough. He says rather that he is the resurrection. He is eternal life's source, its gateway. He is inviting Martha into true life in and through him. And to each person here today, Jesus would ask the same question he asked of Martha. Do you believe this. That's a beautiful and sobering invitation. There is the objective truth that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Then there is this searching question and invitation, do you believe this? Because by faith you can be invited into that beautiful reality of eternal life and resurrection through him. And then Martha's rather remarkable response, yes, Lord, I have always believed you are Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world. In other words, I've always believed that about you, but now I'm recognizing the fuller implications of what that means. I've always known you are Messiah, 
But now I see that that may make a difference even in my brother's life. She returns and finds Mary. She calls Mary aside from the mourners. The teacher is here and he wants to see you. And now Mary immediately went to see Jesus as well. Martha kindly wants Mary, her sister, to hear this news as well. He wants to see you. Mary and her more retiring personality waited for the invitation. And now when Mary arrives and saw Jesus, she falls at his feet and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The same words. But I imagine a very different tone of voice. Less bitterness, more hurt and confusion, but also a hint of faith. And then deep weeping. When Jesus saw her weeping and all of the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Why? Because Jesus was so upset, not that she was crying, because he was about to weep himself, but rather angry at death itself. Howard, we heard how you ended your eulogy. We heard that upset with what had happened. Jesus shares that. That upset with, with how the world is because of the brokenness that sin has brought into the world. Appalled at what sin had done in the world, the separation, the hurt. And he was angry about that. And he says, where have you put him? They told him, Lord, come and see. And then that most profound, shortest verse in Scripture, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Martha had moved Jesus to share a deep theological truth that she needed to hear. Mary had moved Jesus to deep emotion and compassion. Why this weeping? Jesus, you are, as we know now, in about five minutes, going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Why the weeping then? Because Jesus wanted to enter into the sadness of this moment with this woman that he loved so deeply. He wouldn't press fast forward and, and say, oh, don't worry about it because it's all going to be okay soon. Rather, I will enter into your weeping with you now. Now, Jesus knows where we end up as we're with him by faith. He knows the glorious day when he will return and those who believe in him will be with him forever. He knows that and he could easily say to us, oh, don't worry about it now. Don't weep now. It's all going to be fine. But instead, he sits with us now in our sorrow in our brokenness, in our questions, our doubt, our upset, and he sits with us and he weeps. Knowing the hope that is to come, but taking the time to experience that with us now. God weeps with us as we long and wait for our redemption. He cares for us today and his grief with us is real. He understands. The people who were standing by said, see how much he loved him. Others, of course, said, well, he healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry. He arrived at the tomb and he said, roll the stone away. Martha, true to her character, uh, concerned about decorum, uh, she protests and says, he's been dead for four days, the smell will be terrible. Jesus responds, didn't I tell you that you would see the glory of God if you believed? They rolled the stone aside. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said this out loud for the sake of all standing here, so they will believe that you sent me. Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Unwrap him and let him go. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. 
Jesus on this occasion was giving us a taste of what is to come. Lazarus would, would die again. This was not a permanent resurrection for him. That was yet to come in his life. But Jesus was making it clear that his words about I am the resurrection and the life were true. And here was a tangible demonstration as Jesus broke forever the power of death and answered life's biggest questions where death was redefined. Really only weeks after this, Jesus found himself facing his own death where he hung on a cross for us, was buried and resurrected, raised from the dead, not like Lazarus to die again, but rather to never see death again. And Jesus offers that to you as well, asks that question, do you believe this? Martha, ready to articulate a strong faith, Mary, weeping, but weeks later would pour perfume on his feet, Lazarus reclining beside him. Jesus understands our various ways and readiness to come to him. And he speaks to us of forgiveness for our sin. I have permission from Ada. As a matter of fact, she asked if I would share this. Ada sat with Stan just days before his own death and extended forgiveness to him. That's such a beautiful picture of what God does for us. He offers us forgiveness. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, he says, you can be forgiven. You can come and know the forgiveness that I offer to you and be in right relationship with me again. And then, as an outworking of that, we're asked to forgive each other. So we pray, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God offers that to you and to me. Do you believe this? Let us pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the resurrection and the life. And you offer that we believe in you, that we too, though we may die, we will ultimately live forever. I pray your comfort on each person here who you love individually, who are precious to you, who are known by you. And so, Lord, we pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Six hundred seventeen. Six hundred seventeen. I invite you to please stand.
At the end of the worship service, the casket will go to the back and the pallbearers will bring the casket to the vehicle outside. And then everyone is warmly invited to join the family and go downstairs for a time of conversation and a fellowship meal together. The committal service will take place after the meal at the St. Jacob's Mennonite Church Cemetery on Three Bridges Road. And please bring along your bulletins for us to sing Amazing Grace there together, which we will hear in a different form at the end of the service as we leave. After the benediction now, we will sing the doxology here in the sanctuary as our prayer for the meal. So hear these words of benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Amen. Praise God from